Good afternoon. Welcome. If you can all uh, come in and, and sit down, we'll begin our next session. I'm Jay Loft, the publisher uh, of The Atlantic. And I'd like to introduce uh, Jennifer Hunter, who's the Vice President of Corporate Responsibility for the Altria family of companies, to come up and do a, a quick introduction of the panel. Hello. Um, I am excited to introduce this next panel, Ideas That Work, Changing the Odds for Our Nation's Youth, and a focus on Ready by 21 and the Gallup Student Poll. The Altria family of companies have long supported both education and positive youth development, and what we've learned over the years is that by insulating the education pipeline, you really end up with better outcomes both academically, socially, and emotionally for kids. The panel this afternoon is going to be very exciting because you get to hear what kids have to say about how they can stay hopeful and engaged in the educational process and what communities can do to rally around kids and provide them with the supports they need to be successful. We have a very exciting group of panelists today. I'm very pleased to introduce Karen Pittman, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Forum for Youth Investment. And uh, the Forum is actually the managing partner of the Ready by 21 partnership. We have Shane Lopez, who is um, a, a, a senior science, scientist in residence at Gallup and um, an architect of the Gallup student poll. And Justin Bibb, who is the um, associate partner and director of community strategies for Gallup. So we've got an exciting conversation ahead of us, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Greg. Great. Well, we have a lot to talk about uh, and not a lot of time to talk about it in. Um, we'd love to get the folks who are sort of in the wings and in the back if you want to move up. So this is a little more of an intimate gathering. I think we're in this big room, not because we expected hundreds of people, but because uh, we said we had some PowerPoint slides to show and this is the place to do it. So if we can get you to come so we can see you, um, we'd love to have you uh, ask questions uh, uh, and make this as, as, as informal as possible. So it's, this is not an academic presentation, but we wanted to, uh, since we had the, the capacity, put up a couple of visuals to give you a sense of, of, of what we're talking about. So we'll just go ahead and get started. We want to talk a lot today about thinking outside of the box in order to improve the box. So we've been, we're a part of the Innovations in Education series. Um, you had a lot of discussions today about how we improve teachers and teacher quality and recruitment, et cetera. Uh, and the theme that you're gonna hear today is not that we don't wanna do anything about the box called school, clearly we do, but that there's some other ways of bringing information in and connecting information that will actually help us speed up um, our efforts to actually transform that thing called school. Uh, we know school, for example, only takes up part of the developmental space between young people being born and they're moving up into young adulthood, whether you count that as 21 or 25. It only takes up a part of the day um, and a part of the year. It only takes up and works on, especially as we sort of focus in uh, and drill down on academic success, on some of those critical outcome areas where we want young people to be successful. So school really, if we think of those as, de as developmental space, school only fills a part of developmental space. There's a bigger box that we want to talk to you about today um, and, and think about who else fills that space, how they relate to school, and how we can use some new kinds of data to get folks excited. We often think about after school, um, but it's really only a tiny piece of sitting on that piece. Lots of other organizations, community organizations, nonprofits, businesses, civic organizations, faith organizations, and obviously families um, and informal networks play a role in that developmental space. And part of what we have to do is get a greater pulse from that whole space about how young people are doing. Another way to think about that is we also spend time thinking about this education pipeline and how we sort of plug the leaks in the pipe so that young people come in in preschool and they come out the other side through post-secondary education or training ready for work and career. Again, one idea, simple idea to give you is we have to put some insulation around that pipe. Anybody who's taken a shower outside knows that the water may start out hot, but by the time it goes through a long length of pipe, it doesn't come out hot the other end unless you've got some insulation. We need these broader learning supports that are in the communities to be there, and we also need to make sure young people have basic services. So there are a lot of other players in the community 
that we need to engage. And we heard this theme. We've heard these themes about bigger goals and broader partnerships uh, and, and broader strategies. We heard them yesterday in the opening panel. We heard them today. They're recurring themes regardless of the topic. How do we actually think bigger, be bolder, and have broader partnerships? And those partnerships require us having some specificity about who we need to engage. So the first thing we want to do is sort of reset the discussion. Uh, very quickly uh, and suggest that it's absolutely a fact. I'm sure you've heard them by now. We're not going to go over them, except in a different way, that too few young people are really ready for college work and life. We want to start by just saying, just getting them a high school diploma, however, is not the only answer. And there are a couple of reasons for that. I'm going to put up a slide and let Shane talk a little bit about this idea of job readiness. If we want them to be ready for the next thing, then we have to actually have some sense of not just that they have a diploma, but that they're ready. So Shane, give us a little bit on what Gallup has been doing in this space where you have a lot of interest and Absolutely. expertise. Uh, I'll actually take a step back. We do a Gallup World Poll. We go into 160 countries every year and ask, them how they're, how, ask folks how they're doing. Um, we do a Gallup Nightly Poll. We may have called you. Every night we call 1,000 people and we ask you how you're doing. Um, and now we go into the field with a Gallup student poll and we ask folks how they're doing. When we ask them what, what um, does it mean to be a success across the world, the answer is a good job. When we ask parents of kids what does it mean to be a success, the answer is a good job. When we ask kids what does it mean to be a success, the answer is a good job. So we went into the field and we polled 70,000 kids in March. We'll poll over 2 million kids in October through the Gallup student poll, and, and it's doubtful that that response will change. Um, we try to dig deeper into this and look at this issue of job readiness, and 72% of graduating seniors uh, said that they have two good work ideas. So they are thinking about the world of work, and they have two good ideas at the ready to, to act upon. Again, they also say um, that success equals a good job. Um, they met two people that are doing the kind of work they're interested in. Two people that are doing the kind of work they're interested in. So yes, there, there are all these staggering t statistics about graduation, but these folks are thinking about the future. They're transcending, in a way, the idea of, oh, I've got to graduate um, to get a good job. They're thinking about a good job today. They're thinking about a good job when they're juniors and sophomores. Um, and then finally, 61% reported that they visited a workplace where they could do something meaningful and productive. So they're mixing it up with the world of work and trying to make sense out of it. So we do have a third of folks who are not doing this, and we're, we're of course, very concerned about those. But the excitement, the energy that we are tapping into suggests that folks want a good job as early as uh, probably fifth grade. Mm -hmm. They start thinking about a good job. But what does it mean, Shane, that, that, that for seniors who are graduating, only Six, six out of ten have actually visited a workplace, if they have yeah. a good concrete sense of, sense of what it means to actually go to work. Of course, you know, I'm going to spin the positive side of this because I'm excited um, because we were guessing that it might have been lower than that. Mm -hmm. But for those four of ten um, who are not ready for the world of work, um, they, number one, may not be engaged in school. Number two, they may not be hopeful about the future. And number three, they may not have the energy uh, it takes to get out there and mix it up with the world of work. So those are the folks who need some special attention. Um, so in, in a sense, six of 10 just need what we've been doing, but mm -hmm. four of 10 need something unique and special that would expose them to the relevance of the work world. Mm -hmm. Okay, you wanna do your next one? Sure. Oh, this is Graduating Seniors in Entrepreneurship. Um, we're very concerned at Gallup about tomorrow's entrepreneur. And as you know, entrepreneurs make a lot of mistakes. Um, so we want them to start failing early. It would be better if they start failing in fifth grade rather than in college. So they're going to have a lot of failed businesses before they create a great business. Um, and whether they're uh, entrepreneurs looking for um, the bottom line or entrepreneurs trying to create social capital, um, we're very interested in helping people think about that. Um, you know, what, what I am, uh, what I do find promising is that about 76% of graduating seniors have some good business ideas. So they have this healthy self-efficacy, this healthy belief in self that they can conjure up some good business ideas. Unfortunately, and, and the, the bar's a little off, only 57% are willing to invest in their own ideas. Um, and then um, only 64% that people believe that um, other people invest in my ideas. So I have this good idea that's kind of in, in the back of my mind. Reminds me of a story uh, um, out of the uh, LA shipping yards. And there was a guy uh, who 
had uh, built electric movers for freight. And he was you know, moving small bits of freight across the shipping yard. And then the, sh the manager of the shipping yard came in and said, um, could you move 20 tons of freight? And he goes, yeah, I can build an electric truck that would move 20 tons of freight. He goes, why haven't you? And he said, no one ever asked me to. So a lot of these kids are sitting there with ideas that could be the next big thing, but yet no one's really investing in those ideas or tapping into the ideas. Only half of students think they can create something new um, when probably more than that have the potential for doing so. Um, and 74% believe in that American dream that they'll own their own business with a quarter of students believing uh, that that's not possible. And just to interject ahead, one, one point. Um, at Gallup, we understand this is an urgent economic crisis and civil rights issue. And through our research, we identified that education is the biggest driver of economic opportunity. So with 1.2 million students dropping out yearly basis, that's a loss in income to our country of about $330 billion. So we don't figure out a way to create a culture of entrepreneurship in our schools. How do we expect to compete with China and India in the 21st century? So for too long we've had this wall in education where the curriculum is just developed by educators, but what about the business community? What about the venture capitalists and other stakeholders who have a say in the economic opportunities of the future, and that's why it's important to tap into what students are thinking about and how they feel about their ideas for the future. Yeah, and I think that's a perfect segue, I think, into the, the next one, because right now we have this assumption that young people go through, they go through high school and they come out and it's time for them to go to work. The, the alignment and the overlap between tapping into their entrepreneurial spirit, getting them really business experience, business exposure, what that means is that even for the young people who come out of high school with a diploma, Seven in 10 employers see skills beyond academics as critical, things like professionalism and work ethic, teamwork, collaboration, uh, yes, reading comprehension, but ethics, social responsibility, things that you get because you go to work, because mm -hmm. you work in teams, because you try doing things together, and they're not finding those skills. Uh, they found that four in 10 high school graduates, these young people coming into entry-level jobs with diplomas, we're deficient in those basic skills. So we need to get this alignment, uh, and I think that's part of the conversation that we're having. The kind of data that we're getting uh, from Gallup around young people being excited and interested in these things, but not having a deep enough experience base gives us information to bring into that educational setting, whether they give, get those experiences inside of the classroom, which is hard, but they can do it if they're doing teams and robotics and things like that, if we're changing what they do in school. But it also means that we need to look outside of school and engage businesses and community leaders and really get them the opportunities to apply their skills and, and be entrepreneurs. I don't have a cell phone. You have a He's cell saying phone? turn the cell oh. phone off. <laughs> <laughs> it is off, but I'll put it away. Okay, how's that? All right, we figured out the problem, thank you. <laughs> we wondered why we were all buzzing up here. Uh, the second thing that we wanna talk about is that when we, when we think about innovations in education, and that, this is sort of back to a little more data on that pipeline, we zoom in on how are we gonna, what are we gonna do to change that number, change those no child left behind, behind numbers, move young people up academically, get them up to reading at grade level, doing math at grade level, et cetera. All those things are critically important, but again, what we know is that the quality of the learning environment has to happen. We can come in and we can change the curriculum, but if we haven't changed the basic things about the place where young people are spending their time, we tend to not get the content absorbed. The National Research Council, which is a part of the National Academy of Sciences, did lots of work, looked at lots of things, and came up with this list. It's a little nerdy and academic, but young people, I've highlighted the basic words. They need safety and structure and relationships and belonging. They clearly need opportunities for, to build skills. Um, they need opportunities to test those skills and know that the skills that they're using matter. These are pretty basic things that we have. Um, America's Promise has simplified that list. So if you've heard of America's Promise, you've heard of the five promises, and there's a clear relationship between those things. So we can go with the five promises that you can count on one hand. The challenge is when we go into any kind of environment, classrooms or otherwise, and we ask whether those things are happening routinely for young people, they're not. And they're especially not happening in the classrooms and the settings where we have low income kids, young people of color, and young people who are already not doing well academically. If we don't change their environments, we're not gonna get better outcomes. We know overall when you look at those five promises and you survey young people and their families, and this was a survey that the America's Promise Alliance did, 
Only 31% of 6 to 17 year olds are getting four of those five basic promises. Two out of 10 are getting none of them, and it gets worse with age. And I won't read the data to you, I'll just leave it there for a minute. But we have a problem that if we separate our quest to make sure young people are getting out of school, uh, prepared academically, with our need to make sure that they're getting the basic supports that they need and they're getting opportunities to practice those skills outside of school and inside of school, we're really not doing innovative work. Uh, we're continuing to sort of apply old solutions to a problem and not getting the results that we need to have. So let's talk a little bit about what we need to do if we're gonna change the odds for young people. It really means that we have to change the ways that we do business and this is where we get excited because we know that Doing this means that first we have to have some simple way of understanding that young people aren't doing well. And we put some, I talked some of this this morning. This is basically another way of saying when we're looking at the end product, kids coming out the other end of that pipe, only four in 10 of them are doing well in terms of being productive. They're either in college or working steadily. They're healthy, good health habits, healthy relationships, and they're connected to something bigger than themselves. Pretty basic definition of doing well as a young adult. Only four in 10 kids have that. On the other side, two in 10 are really in trouble. And again, I won't take the time to read it, but they've dropped out of school, they're not working, they're on welfare, they're engaged in criminal activities, they're not doing well. So to be able to have a basic definition like this and have only four out of 10 of our kids doing well, again, it links back to the fact that they're not getting those supports that they need. And that fixing this problem, which is the ultimate goal that we have, doesn't happen just by trying to increase test scores in schools. What we know is giving young people those basic supports in school and out, we change that picture very quickly. Young people who have supportive relationships throughout their high school years are five times more likely to come out of high school doing well than young people who don't. That's controlling for everything that you can control for. So we know this. The question is if we know that those kind of supports are needed, how do we get that data? How do we find out this information about young people rather than just getting them in school and measuring their supports? We need to bring some powerful solutions to passionate leaders. We know that there are passionate leaders out there who care about kids. So again, the themes that we've been hearing about bigger goals, bolder strategies, broader partnerships. I want to lead us up to some more data from Gallup and hand it back over to Shane um, uh, and Justin, because we need data if we're going to do innovation in education that goes beyond tracking academics and test scores, it goes beyond just tracking school attendance, and it goes beyond basic questions of access. Do young people have access to school and access to college? We need data that really helps us solve the problem, crack the nut, understand the connection between how well young people are doing, what kind of experiences they have, what kind of exposures they have in school and out, and what kind of states of being they have, how they feel about themselves and their lives and where they're going. Uh, and that is what leads us up to the big one, and then I'll let you yeah. do the detailed stuff. Yeah. Only one in four students in America are hopeful, thriving, and engaged. So fifth grade through 12th grade. So out of 34 million kids that live in that space of fifth grade through 12th grade, only one in four of those students possess this excitement about the future, um, possess this um, engagement with school, this enthusiasm for school, and finally um, have a high level of well-being. So one in four kind of hit the trifecta. Um, and Beyond that, unfortunately, um, we see a good number of students who have, um, they have a lack of hopefulness, so they're discouraged. They have active disengagement in school, and then they have a low level of well-being, which we refer to as suffering. And you've got the detailed ones there. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, yeah. but, but think about the last six or seven slides you saw. So this, this was our challenge. Think about the National Research Council stuff, America's Promises stuff, the Gamboni stuff. Um, measure all of that in 20 items or less. Do it for free and do it in a way that every student in America um, can have the opportunity to give us their voice. Why did we want the student voice? Well, we've been collecting data on the student voice for a long time, but what, what we didn't do well is um, we didn't blank in America, number one. And we also used it as kind of an adjunct to other um, data that we were sharing because we thought the other data would happen to be more important and that would be what drives change. We've changed our thinking. At Gallup, we believe that if we have the voice of 34 million students um, and Arnie Duncan's support, we can change education. Exactly. Um, so it's not having Arnie Duncan saying something, it's having 34 million kids saying this is what's happening in America's schools and we think that that's the data that will drive the innovation in education today. So we got kind of wacky. We said, what are the things that drive all those other things mm -hmm. Karen just talked about? 
Um, just a real world example, I asked a principal um, that we just completed a research study with, I said, what are your predictors of graduation in your high school? And he said, attendance in the ninth grade, GPA in the ninth grade, and then um, credits earned in the ninth grade. And then I said, what predicts those three things? He said, I don't know. I don't know. So we did a study. We looked at what predicts those three things and then followed those guys. And we found that hope predicts those three things. So hope predicts the things that predicts graduation. So we're backing up one step. And what we did, we landed on hope, engagement, and well-being because they could be reliably measured. They're not measured by any other big survey study. Um, and these are things that we can change. So I'm going to share with you in a minute that only 50% of America's kids are hopeful. Well, that's horrible news. But the good side is we can enhance hope in the 50% of American mm -hmm. kids that aren't hopeful. So hope is powerful because it does predict GPA and retention over and above, and this is for college students, high school GPA and ACT, SAT. So you remember the joys of taking the SAT. Well, that predicted a little bit of your performance in your freshman year of college. Hope, a simple uh, six uh, question measure, out predicts the performance that the SAT predicted over and above. Engagement distinguishes between high performing schools and low performing schools across America. And again, it's the, the enthusiasm and energy you have for school. And then well-being, people think, oh, well-being is an outcome variable. We want kids to have a high level of well-being at the end of this process. And what we found in the last few years, led by the research of Sonia Leibmerski and UC Riverside, we found that well-being drives academic success as well as vocational success. So we're measuring these three things in 20 items or less in eight and a half minutes across America. Um, again, that's why we, we pick those uh, three things and um, what I mentioned, the, the educational outcomes are important because we wanted these predictive measures. This is the well-being summary. So this is based on 70,000 students that completed the Gallup student poll in March. So we had a select group of uh, communities that were invited to participate in the Gallup student poll, and then we invited some of our client communities as well. Beyond that, um, we basically, it was, it was invitation only for March. We had 70,000 students um, from 335 schools, 58 districts, 18 states complete the Gallup student poll. What we found from that data is 63% of kids in America are thriving. Um, if you look at the adult data on the Gallup poll uh, website, so gallup.com, again, we call people every night and ask them about their well-being, 50% of adults in America are thriving. This is the third straight month that we're above 50% of adults in America thriving. We had gone down below 50% during the, um, the, the economic uh, pitfall that, that we all experienced. 36% of students are, are struggling, and then 1% of American students uh, are suffering. So it sounds like a small number, but that 1% of students that are suffering may be doing the suffering for 70, 80%, all the suffering that 70, 70 80% of all the suffering that young people go through today. So these people are, are really hurting. When we look at hope, 50% of American students are hopeful. So these are guys who are saying that um, I have big dreams for the future. I have the energy it takes to get there. I can solve any problem you throw at me. Um, and and I, can, I can make the future mine. Uh, David Brooks wrote a column last year, maybe earlier this year, in review of uh, Gladwell's outlier book. Um, he said, um, what, what success boils down to are these two things. Number one, successful people believe that tomorrow will be better than today. And number two, successful, believe, successful people believe they have the power to make it so. That's what hopeful people do. Hopeful people believe that tomorrow will be better than today and they have the power to make it so. Um, unfortunately, half the kids in America don't believe that. And in fact, 17% of the kids in America would say, that's crazy talk. That's crazy talk. That's just not the way the world works. And then when we look at engagement, now engagement, there are other folks who measure something they call engagement. And they go in and they talk a lot about behaviors, about seat time and time in the library and all that good stuff. What we do, we just want to know about your energy and enthusiasm for school, plain and simple. So we go in and we ask you um, about, about those things and we get it to the heart of the matter. 50% of American students are engaged. Now, that's good and that's bad. The good side, of course, is that we can help these students become engaged by creating more engaged classrooms. 30% um, 30, 30 are not engaged. So these folks are basically, 
they're there, they're present. So you remember maybe in grade school, they took roll every morning and you had to say here or present. Well, those folks are saying here or present, but that's about all they're doing the whole day, okay? 20% of American students, and I'm sad to say a greater percentage than that of American teachers are actively disengaged, actively disengaged. And what that means is that whatever your goals are, I will undermine. If you wanna learn today, it ain't gonna happen. If you wanna teach me today, it ain't gonna happen. So 20% of active engage disengagement has a huge effect on American classrooms. Clearly then, message five, as we're running through these quickly, is that school business can, can community leaders can use this kind of data to spark change. Now first, this kind of data has to be collected. Second, it has to be shared widely in the community. It has to get outside of the schools. But because we're looking at things that we can measure quickly, we can measure repeatedly, and as, as Shane and Justin said, we can change these things. These are very malleable. So not only are they strong predictors of the things that we want in terms of academic success and workforce readiness, they're also things that if we get in there and change the environments in which young people are participating, we can change these factors very quickly and we can count them, we can measure them, we can report them back to the community. So this morning on, on the panel, we talked about what does it mean to tell the country that a third of young people aren't graduated from high school on time? We, we, we put out a lot of depressing statistics. Um, they don't get us outraged. They tend to, to just leave us kind of numb. When we hear bad data after bad data after bad data, what we want to do is to close the feedback loop, to say, this really isn't working. Half of the young people in this school are not engaged, and we're going to disaggregate it by schools. We're going to, so that's, you know, you're going to look across your schools, and some of your schools are going to have kids who are engaged and some aren't. What do you want to do with that? You can look at this data inside of schools. Some of your classrooms have students who are engaged. If you have tracks in your school, your magnet track, high level of engagement. Mm -hmm. Your special ed track, mm -hmm. low level of engagement. What do you want to do about that? If we don't like that picture and we think we can change it, we can come back six months later and see if we've changed it when the Gallup poll comes back again. This is one of the reasons that the Ready by 21 partnership is so excited about bringing these kinds of tools into communities because without this kind of leading data, this data that we can bring back to see if we come in, make an intervention, and if we're making a difference in young people and how they're thinking about themselves, how they're thinking about where they are and what they're doing, if we wait to see if they graduate from high school, we've wasted a lot of time just pouring things into this black box without knowing what's going on. So, Again, a little bit more about some of the data. Uh, I, I love this slide, it's kind of <laughs> clunky, but um, if, you, if you look into it, you, you really get a good sense of, of what American students are telling us. Um, part of well-being is how you evaluate your life, evaluative well-being, and the other part of well-being is experienced well-being. Um, so we measure both. So we do this wonderful ladder of life scale. So this is audience participation. So on the ladder of life, with zero being your worst possible life and 10 being your best possible life, on which rung of the ladder do you stand today? Okay, take a little snapshot. And then on which rung of the ladder will you stand in five years? Little snapshot, okay? So what we found is that 63% of American students say they're at a seven or higher on both. Okay, so that's where the thriving comes from. Uh, so if you're at a seven or higher on both, excuse me, a seven on the first one and, and an eight on the second one, eight or higher on that one, you're thriving. The other part of well-being is how was yesterday and how are you feeling about your life, essentially. So we ask students, um, were you respected all day yesterday? All day, and you get to say yes or no. Um, did you smile or laugh a lot yesterday? Did you learn or do something interesting yesterday? And did you have enough energy to get things done yesterday. 52% said they were treated with respect all day yesterday. So thinking about that pipeline, mm -hmm. where students are living, well, they're spending a lot of time in school and they're spending a little mm -hmm. bit of time getting to school, spending some time at home. So we have to think about after school and where does the respect breakdown happen for half of America's kids? Mm -hmm. Fortunately, and this is, I think, rightfully so, uh, these kids who shouldn't have the economy on their mind and shouldn't be watching bad TV and all that good stuff, um, shouldn't be worried about John and Kate's marriage. They are <laughs> smiling and laughing a lot. 82% of folks said they smiled or laughed a lot yesterday. They learned or did something interesting yesterday, 70%. I was heartened by that statistic because um, the big complaint about American schools is that they're boring and irrelevant. And some of our data 
uh, happens to support that, but at least folks are learning and doing something interesting yesterday. We only poll Tuesday through Friday, so yesterday for the majority of kids, vast majority, is a school day. Um, did you have enough energy to get things done yesterday? 72% said yes. Now, there are two disturbing trends that mirror each other, one related to experience well-being and one related to um, engagement in school. That's the next one. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so. Um, with both of these, and I might flip back and forth, you see a little downward trend there. Okay? So yesterday's get less positive the longer you go, um, the longer you stay in school until the ninth or tenth grade, it kind of bottoms out in the ninth grade, and then students who are having the worst yesterdays and are truly disengaged, active disengagement, they're hitting the road. So there are your dropouts, okay? When we look more closely at this engagement issue, um, the fifth grade might be the happiest place on earth. I think kindergarten's probably the happiest place on earth, not Disney. Um, too many lines at Disney. So the kindergarten is the happiest place on earth, and it probably is okay first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and it starts to deteriorate a little bit come sixth grade. And then middle school starts at sixth or seventh, and you see that I went from having this engaged experience at school to having a disengaged experience at school. So we've lost individualization, we've lost mattering and belonging, and then it goes all the way down to 10th grade, and then, of course, we don't include dropouts. So it looks like there's an uptick. Oh, we're back up to 39%. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the folks who have dropped out took their active disengagement with them. And the folks who showed up for school the day we polled, uh, only 39. So four in 10 juniors and seniors that sh took the initiative to show up for school hadn't dropped out yet, said they were engaged in school. And, and this is really the cutting edge of what we like to call a Gallup behavioral economics. Um, and what it is, it's a, a new paradigm of viewing how we create effective interventions in schools and in the broader community. So we can predict that in fifth grade, they have high levels of engagement and it's gonna decrease over time. Then we can set up those support systems uh, that Karen talked about in a more effective way and align our resources better so that we could be ahead of the curve as opposed to working from behind, behind the game. And for us to you know, get our schools in the right direction, we have to, we have to look at these pre preventive indicators That's more right. effectively. Absolutely. And we take advantage of BE findings all the time, behavioral economics findings. Um, so we've constructed this so that uh, in almost every state in the union, in most districts, it requires only passive consent. So sending a letter home saying in two weeks your student will take the Gallup student poll, if you do not want her to take it, send this signed form back is very different from sending a letter home saying, active consent, you have to sign this for Susie to take the Gallup student poll. So we're, we're getting, po uh, we're kind of nudging folks to make good decisions about gathering these data on, on their students and it's helped us tremendously in the yeah. field. And for those who think, well this is just, you know, reflective of adolescence. Young people are just gonna disengage because that's what surly adolescents do. Um, there's another study which we don't have a, a slide for, um, done by a, a, a student of uh, 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 Shikshna Mahali's who had students carrying beepers. Uh, and every hour they were beeped and they were asked where they were and they were basically asked if they were engaged uh, and if they were thinking. So they're, mm -hmm. they're gonna ask you, you know, are you concentrating and are you motivated? I'm gonna ask these two pieces which sort of add up to, to mm -hmm. engagement. Um, and when they were beeped in class, there were very low levels of concentration <laughs> and motivation. When they were beeped and they happened to be with their friends, they were motivated but they weren't concentrating. When they were beeped and they were in a sports event, they were motivated and concentrating, but the highest levels came from when they were, they were, they were engaged in what we would call a structured voluntary activity. They were in an arts, they were doing the arts, they were in theater, they were doing something that was using their skills and their interest in a setting and that made sense to them. That's where you had the highest levels. And that doesn't mean we should shut down schools and send everyone off into these other things, but it does mean that again, the direction that we're going of shutting down all of these kinds of things where young people can have these more complex engagement opportunities in teams on things that they're interested in because we're trying to get them to read and calculate better is going in the wrong direction. We can get those engagement levels reversed in school, but we can't do it if we don't think differently about the kind of things that can happen during the school day. So I know we've got probably about 10 minutes left, and so let's just talk a little bit, uh, is that my watch right? Mm -hmm. okay. Um, about, just going to give you a little bit about this partnership and then open it up uh, for some questions. Um, we can focus on student outcomes, but the Ready by 21 partnership is really focused on leaders. 
and is really trying to, to get both provocative information to get the folks who are leading our schools, leading our communities, leading our businesses, everyone who wants to make sure young people are coming at the end of that pipe prepared, get them thinking differently by putting different kinds of data in front of them to sort of shake them up into thinking we can fix this because we need to get more outraged about this but also more optimistic that we can change it. And then we're also really trying to develop very strong partnerships with organizations like Gallup that we can bring these kinds of tools into communities so people can collect this data themselves. It's one thing to see a slide up and see some research. It's another thing to see this about the kids in your community. So as, as, as Shane and Justin said, the Gallup student poll has already moved out and it's gonna move out more. We show this map uh, a couple months from now and it's gonna be in even more places and that's an exciting part of the partnership. This dizzying slide is the, are the technical partners that we've put together so far to really bring into communities different ways to collect information like are young people participating not just in school but what are they participating in out of school that we can actually track whether they're going to the library they're going to the boys and girls club what they're participating in because we know basically the more they are engaged in those kind of things the more it counts so we're trying to bring these kinds of tools into communities and those are our technical partners the form is partnered with united way of america sort of a brand name most people know with the school administrators with the Search Institute that's really developing community coalitions around the country, legislators, the nonprofit organizations. These are the leaders at the state and local level that you need sitting around the table looking at this data and making a commitment to really say, six months from now, a year from now, we want these Gallup numbers to change. We want the participation numbers to change. This is what we want to do. So those are the folks that are in our partnership. And the last slide that I'll show you is just, it sounds wonky to say if we can get communities to have better data, they will get better outcomes, but it's true. This is a quick slide from Louisville where the schools, in the same way that, the, that uh, uh, Shane and Justin just described, the schools basically got parents' permission to track whether they young, where their young people were going outside of school, have strong relationships with the set, a network of community providers in their low-income neighborhoods, um, and by having this partnership and by having data flow back and forth between the schools and the community providers and having data collected about individual students so you have an expanded report card to know what young people are doing in school and out, what content they're getting in school and out, and how well they're doing in school and out on a broader range of outcomes. They've increased the efficiency of those organizations and they have led to increased school attendance, reductions in suspensions, increase in reading, improvements in their, uh, their academic achievement scores, you can read the rest of this. This is happening because communities are using precision data and we haven't even brought the Gallup poll in. Mm -hmm. So the partnership that we're building is really bringing communities real tools to do real-time data to be able to plan, set goals, and not just hope that they're gonna get there, but actually turn the light on in that black box um, and figure out how they're gonna do it. So with that, we're gonna stop, see if there are questions. I think there's still two mics. I can't see them, but I'm trusting that they're there. Uh, mics on either end of the, uh, the session. Um, we are trying to change the way leaders do business. We talk about moving that small gear uh, to make a difference uh, because we can do that quickly. So we can change the way leaders do business in one or, with one or two outcomes. And Karen, so if you don't mind, just one final point. Yeah. Um, we sat in with, at Gallup with some of the foremost leaders and partners in education uh, trying to address the dropout and positive youth outcomes for students. And they all said that all we've done to curb the dropout rate hasn't worked. So all the billions of dollars we spent to, to increase graduation rates, nothing's worked. So what does that tell us? We gotta do things differently. So part of the reason why we wanted the Gallup Student Poll in conjunction with America's Promise Alliance is really, it's a call to action that communities have to own these metrics at the local level because national solutions just won't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Business leaders, parents, teachers, we all have to own the metrics in a new way and student voice has to take a leading role in how we change schools across the country. It just can't be with politicians and unions. Students have to be at the driver's seat. I, I wanna talk about <coughs> parents real quick. We, we polled parents. I, I mean, we get these wacky ideas and then we say, why don't we poll them? So we polled them. Um, and we were wondering about parents with, uh, with children in school, what they are doing to change the dropout rate at their local high school, whether their kid goes to it now or not. So we polled parents and we asked them that question. What's the one thing you can do to increase the retention rate at your local high school? And what was the most common response? 23% said nothing. nothing. Mm -hmm. Don't know nothing. A quarter of parents of school-aged children in America are stymied by this issue. So they have, 
They have a stake in, in the outcome, and they don't see themselves That's as right. active, active participants. Mm -hmm. So through this community organizing, mm -hmm. we also empower parents at the local level to transform the schools at their, in their neighborhood. We have a question over here, I believe. Great. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering, um, in this whole paradigm, what, what's the role of curriculum versus teachers and, and the skills that they bring? Is, is one more important than another? Is there a chicken and the egg there? I'll in take the, a quick shot and, and, and sure. hand off. Obviously, they're both important. Um, the, the curriculum, in the end, the, the, the quality of the content that's coming into the classroom is what's going to ultimately help that young person succeed. The quality of the teaching that happens is going to not only influence the content, but set up that environment. So everything that we know suggests that, that if we can't create a high quality learning environment, the content doesn't get applied or it doesn't get applied evenly. So we need both. Um, but what we're learning um, is that we can, with, we can with reasonable precision, if you really come in at the classroom level or sort of the sort of point of service where young people are connecting with adults, and you assess that environment, not by test scores, but you would actually come in and assess the quality of that environment, show teachers, you can show them videos, you can show them the scores on whether they are engaging students against that list that we had up earlier, uh, and give them tools to actually improve. They can improve their performance. When they improve their performance, then the absorption of the content goes up. So we need both. Of course, I mean, it's a very meaningful question, and, and you know, we try to answer that question every day at Gallup. So we help districts such as Richmond um, pick great teachers, because great teachers mm -hmm. and hopeful and engaged and thriving kids make a great learning environment, kids do well. But there are parts of the system that are a little broken. Um, for example, we go in and we collect data on students in eight and a half minutes, very meaningful data, and then we share the summary of that data with the schools within two weeks. Within two weeks, okay? In the current school environment, we ask kids to buy into the curriculum, buy into the great teacher, work their tails off for a very long time, learn all the stuff that they need to be tested on. They're told this is very, very important. Mm. They take the test and they never see the results. Mm. The results come out four, six, eight months later. So in a sense, there's this huge disconnect mm -hmm. where I think the students will stop believing us. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is really important, but we're not gonna send you the results for six months. This is really important, but we're not gonna show you your results. So beyond great teachers and great curricula and, and engaged students, you know, there's some systemic changes that need to occur. And if we can pull off for free a Gallup student poll where you can take the poll in eight and a half minutes and get your results within two weeks, I, I think the American education system mm -hmm. can create tests that can be done in a shorter period of time with the results given back to superintendents and principals in a shorter period of time. And Arnie Duncan has talked a lot about, you know, teacher effectiveness being the key new movement in education. And we really think this is a new data system mm -hmm. and a new way that goes beyond test scores that measures how effective teachers are. If I'm a teacher and I'm increasing hope, I'm doing my job. If I'm increasing right. engagement, I'm doing my job. If my kids are thriving, I know I'm doing my job. So these are important ways to measure teacher effectiveness in a new way and a new thought process that changes the way we have mm -hmm. policy in schools across the country. And we're happy to talk to you more about some of that. We've got two more questions over here. The lack of engagement, well-being, and hope are super pernicious problems. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know, it's probably more of a philosophical question, of what has happened in the recent decades to cause these markers to go down? Yeah, unfortunately, we haven't been tracking um, hope, engagement, and well-being um, for a very long time. And we can look at certain studies and, and the National Longitudinal Youth Study and other things to get some answers there. But it does look like um, hope, engagement, well-being are, as you said, going down. Um, what's happening is not exactly clear. Uh, you know, everybody who's in one camp points the finger at the other camp. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to figure that out right now. So for the first time ever, every March and every October across the nation, we'll gather the data. And we can look at how hope, engagement, and well-being moves up and down, up and down. Uh, we do that with adults right now. And, and I can tell you, although hope, engagement, and well-being are not, as we measure, are not linked to income uh, at all based on our stats, um, well-being in adults is often linked to income. And it's often linked to economic prosperity. So there's some issues there that we have to get a closer look at. Um, one thing we did find, though, in the classroom, we found that hope and well-being relates to 
um, the size of the classroom. Hoping, so the more kids you have per teacher, the less hope and well-being you have of that group of kids. Um, so we're taking a closer look at that. Again, it's just a pilot study, but it's a great question. And now with new data, we can answer that question a couple years from now. And Shane, just for, on that one, because we, we didn't talk much about slicing through this data mm -hmm. for demographics and other things. Yeah. The last figure that you just, just cited, is that controlling for uh, the, the socioeconomic character of the school? Um, character of the school, right. So what we can't get from kids right now is individual household income. And they're not great reporters of that right. anyway. My right. kids said I made six million dollars and weighed five pounds. Um, it's we're not going to go after that data sure. just yet, but we'll try to do some catchment right. studies that would allow us to answer right. that. But the, the 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 partnership that we're building means that we can have the Gallup folks come in and do this this poll. Mm -hmm. um, we can we're working with folks who mine that data in from other places, so we can hook up the data that we already have about young people, their financial, their parents' income, all those things, so you're getting a much more complex picture. Do we have is there another question, another question on this side? Yes, two-part question real okay. fast. One is, how do we get these slides? <laughs> and then secondly, um, if, if we are interested in this and we might be able to help a community, what do we do? Good. Um, there you go. Right there. <laughs> um, you can uh, chat with us after. Yeah, yeah, you can chat with us after to get the slides. Um, we can send those to you. Um, every person in this room can, can contact a principal or superintendent, Yvonne, you'll get a lot of contacts, and say, um, superintendent, we'd love to have the Gallup student poll um, in our district. And again, it, it is free for school use. Um, and in terms of organizing, all those organizations that Karen put up there on her slide are aware of the data and are trying to make sense out of the data. <laughs> but it boils down to that very local question yeah. of what can I do? Um, and you know we're we're getting really good at the science of how to kid, make kids more hopeful, engaged, and, and well-being. So I guess the answer is stay tuned and also come up here at the very end. Thank you. Hi, question? thank you. I appreciate uh, having the opportunity. Um, I, I, I greatly appreciate the fact that you acknowledged early childhood up here because not many uh, of our sessions have acknowledged early childhood. And knowing that 85% of a child's brain. Mm -hmm. It's developed by the age of three. And that's a staggering thought that we think we're going to go into kindergarten and make the systemic change when so much has been developed before six. So how are you all really tying in your metrics and the impact of early childhood in, in the metrics that you're, you're gathering uh, later down mm -hmm. the road? Um, again, the value of this partnership is that everybody doesn't have to do everything. Mm -hmm. um, so number one, uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have United Way of America as a partner. United Way has been very, very strong in the early childhood space, um, having set up Success by Six, but also just more broadly, uh, you know, yeah, early childhood is one of the things that's done by most United Ways. And United Way right now is actually working with several folks um, to develop uh, and bring in through their United Ways indices that'll sort of collect onto this. And they don't do them because of the young age. They don't do them at the individual kid level. Um, but the EDI, and I now forget what EDI, Education Development Index, uh, actually sort of measures at the neighborhood level the likelihood of how well young people are doing, and it's been tested. So there are things that are happening, and we have partners, again, um, that are really trying to connect that. That slide that I put up that said we can move from four out of 10 to seven out of 10, um, doing well, but we can obviously get to nine and a half out of 10 if we add in early childhood. That was just mm -hmm. making, but the importance of that slide was we could make that difference by investing in adolescents. And while 85% of the brain is developed at age three, uh, by age three you have another big spurt that happens in adolescence that we don't take right. advantage of. Right. Just two quick places to find information about that, readysetlearn.com. Uh, Discovery Television has invested in uh, basically creating resilient uh, TV watchers, um, but resilient learners as well. Um, so we've worked with them in the past to help them create those hope, engagement, and well-being strategies um, through mom and dad. Uh, and we disseminate them through, believe it or not, cartoons. And then um, if you've ever had a goldfish cracker, um, you know how addictive they are, or at least for little kids. Goldfish has a website um, called fishfulthinking.com. And there, we impart information about hope to parents of the kids that you're talking about. Um, so there are different avenues, but we're trying to pull all of those different resources mm -hmm. together. And through the partnership, what we're really trying to do is take all those islands and pockets of excellence across the country and make them systems of excellence That's right. so that we, every child can succeed in life. That's La a, that's last question, goal. I think. 
I have just two, uh, three quick things actually. Number one is uh, I came in a little late. Did, are you asking the same questions of teachers in um, terms of engagement and so forth, the three, three things? We're asking the same engagement questions um, of teachers and we're asking the same well-being questions of teachers. We haven't instituted the HOPE piece yet. I will okay. tell you, teachers have some of the highest well-being of any profession in America. Okay. Um, and we found that a across a study of, um, I think, about 12,000 teachers. I've had a chance to sit in on some class in Washington, D.C. in the last uh, couple of years. And uh, the stress on teachers is unbelievable in these, in these classrooms. And some of them were well-to-do schools and some of them were not. But I, I think that element is a huge element. Mm -hmm. The second thing I just want to mention is that as far as engaging the communities, uh, character counts people. Mm -hmm. you know, that whole, they've done a beautiful yeah. job engaging a whole number of communities yeah. with the pillars and so forth. I'm sure you're... you're Absolutely. In, in, in uh, and and the, the, sl the folks that we have up, up on our slide are the partners. Each of those partners is committed to finding the other kinds of organizations like them yeah. that are doing this kind of work and bringing it to the table. Really so our job isn't to have hundreds, but to do this. And the intent really is to, to line up all the kind of tools that help you do everything from community engagement to building a good partnership to collecting better data to doing a good plan to lobbying and you know sort of moving things through at the state policy level to bring all that together in a package so that communities don't have to mix and match all these things themselves and where we where we have uh, been doing it for a while it's actually making a difference so i know we're out of time um, i'm going to thank shane and justin for coming thank to you. join us thank you um, and thank you all <laughs>